So hello everybody, uh, welcome to Symbolism Happens Spotlight, which is the part of the show where we spotlight a member of the Symbolic World community and just uh, talk to them. So today we have Noah on the show, so hello, how are you doing Noah? How's it going? Hey, happy to be here. All right, all right, perfect. So um, we'll just start and get right into it. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Noah? What do you do? How did you get to Symb Symbolic World? Sure, yeah, so... Um... Basic info about me, I live in Owensboro, Kentucky. I, I'm from Oklahoma originally. I moved here about five months ago. Um, now I'm teaching, uh, I teach English at a Christian high school here in Owensboro. I uh, also do counseling for a, a company called Deep Waters Biblical Counseling. Uh, besides that, I do various types of marketing, uh, and social, social media writing, content writing for a ton of different companies. So a little bit of everything, you know, just quite a bit of stuff. Um, I'm married. Uh, we have a daughter named Hannah, and we have our second daughter on the way uh, named Judith, and she'll be here in December. Uh, I guess, so basically how I got into symbolism, uh, and basically specifically Jonathan Paggio, um, I think it was kind of the same way a lot of people did. I think it would have been 2018 or so that I, a friend of mine had recommended Jordan Peterson to me at one point. So I interacted with uh, just a couple of his videos and kind of forgot about it. Had sort of a crisis of faith a few months later. And uh, I grew up uh, reformed evangelical Baptist, basically, and uh, had sort of a crisis of faith. And so I ended up kind of returning back to some of Jordan Peterson's biblical lectures that he did that are heavily, heavily pulled from a lot of Jonathan Paget's work and a lot of symbolism and things like that. And one of the later lectures, he actually brings uh, Math Matthew is how you guys say it, right? Canadian. Matthew. 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 <laughs> we talked about this last time. Yeah. Um, so, and Jonathan, he brought them onto an episode. So I kind of, through the biblical lectures, I, I interacted with symbolism and kind of the, the way that the, say, the early church fathers read scripture. And then that also introduced me to Jonathan Paget's work. So a lot of things happened to me as I was watching through those lectures. And then um, basically I started listening to Jonathan Paget's work got really interested in, in his work. Um, I remember my first reaction to his work was sort of like, I felt like he was speaking a different language, but I knew it was a language that was actually older than the one that I was speaking. And it was a language that was native to Christianity. So it felt like I was hearing someone talk about my own religion. That was part of my religion, but from 300 years ago, 500 years ago, 1500 years ago. And that was a, it was a language that I wanted to know more about. It was very beautiful to me. And I wanted to enter into that as much as I as much as I possibly could. So. Yeah, I um, I remember myself when I first got introduced to uh, Jonathan's videos, um, just thinking back to all the stories I'd learned as a kid. I also grew up Protestant, so you know you learn all these stories as a kid, and for felt like for a very very long time, there wasn't the stories. Yes, they made sense. They had their their moral, but it wasn't much deeper than that. And then going into Pajot and discovering his work, it's just kind of these stories bubbling back up with all sorts of new meanings now, and then realizing that this is the interpretive grid that, you know, the church has been using for a very, very long time. It's, it's special. It's interesting. Um, so Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, one of the things that popped out to me, you mentioned like growing up hearing the stories and things like that. It was sort of like, they were almost for me, they weren't even stories. They were more like chronologies. Like they're just lists of events, you yeah. know, of things that happened. But I didn't understand how to read them in any way that mattered to me, you know. Not that everything has to have this sort of moralistic application by itself, but it was that these were just sort of historical narratives. And you would read it the same way you'd read, like, about, you know, the Trojan War or something like that. Yeah. Like this is something that happened in the past, and it doesn't have any relevance to me in my day to day life. Um, and then that was sort of held separately from, um, from say Paul's epistles or something like that. Something that's more meaty in terms of its straight, straightforward theology. Um, and then that was kind of where the focus was placed. And so I think Jonathan Pazza's work really helped to bring those two together, especially always having a deep love for like CS Lewis's writings and things like that. Um, narrative had always become, it had become very powerful to me, but it was separate from my Christianity at that point. So Jonathan Paget really helped to bring those two together into a really beautiful relationship to where now in my mind, they're inseparable. 
Yeah, and um, I know Jonathan talks a lot about uh, just go to church eventually. Like you, it's good to understand the stories, but eventually you have to commit to something. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to ask, like you personally, in in your day to day life, how have like, how have the ideas of the symbolic world just uh, affected you? Maybe changed your outlook on certain things, um, but in a more you know day to day practical sense. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, whenever I was kind of beginning to rebuild my faith, I would say I was probably five, five years ago or so, four or five years ago. Um, I remember listening to Pajo talk a lot about how faith is not something that just happens in terms of mental ascent. It's something that has to be embodied, right? Um, belief is not something that you just, um, that just happens in your mind. If you really believe something, it, it becomes part of your whole being, right? And that's that's why in the Bible it's so important that it emphasizes worship the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? It's the wholeness of your being participating together, right? And, and in a sense, worship is the harmonization of each aspect of us and bringing that together and integrating that fully. So, um, so whenever I was kind of working through this, I, at the time I did kind of what a lot of, a lot of people do as their, uh, I don't know, devotional practice, if you want to call it, which was standard read a chapter of scripture in the morning, maybe read a section of a devotional, something like that, you know, just, mm. just, and, you know, just pick a random book, just work through it, that kind of thing, you yeah. know, just your kind of basic uh, stuff. And so I started, um, I got on the internet and started just scouring for some kind of historic um, structure, some kind of historic template for devotion right what i ended up finding um i'll actually have it right here i haven't used this one in a while i use a different one now but this is the one i found um it's this right here this is called the book of common prayer and so the book of common prayer this is the 2019 edition put out by the anglican church in north america but um the book of common prayer is basically a collection of prayers and um, it's a lot of things. It's a collection of prayers that has been um, developed and collected throughout the whole 2,000 years of Christianity. So some of these prayers go back to the very beginning of the church. Some of them are, you know, 1,000 years old, 500 years old. Some of them are more, are more recent. But it's basically, which is a really beautiful image of what the church is, right? It's it's the community of saints. It's, the, it's Christians from all times fellowshipping together. And aside from that, it also has a... Uh, a Bible reading plan as part of it, but it's not just a standard Bible reading plan where it just, you know, you just start at the beginning and work through it. The, the scripture passages are harmonized and it works kind of like a symphony with the prayers in the book itself and with the time of the liturgical calendar, which is something I started getting really into through, you know, being exposed to first Jordan Peterson, then Jonathan Pajot, and then also kind of Catholic uh, YouTube, which was, you know, uh, like Bishop Robert Barron and people like that as well. Um, so anyway, I started becoming really familiar with the prayer book. Um, and this is the same thing that like C.S. Lewis would have used, you know, so it's been a historic element of Christianity for a long time. And that ended up, that's still what I do every day with my family, you know, so uh, morning and evening, it's broken up. The main parts of it are morning and evening prayer. Uh, so I still do that. That's kind of how it's taken root in my own personal life. Um, and so that's, that ended up forming me in such a way that I, uh, really began to understand and wrap my mind around the way Anglicanism, which is where, which is the branch of the church that uses the prayer book, um, this one specifically. And I really began to understand Anglicanism, become interested in it. And that's what I eventually, when I moved here to Owensboro, I joined the Anglican parish here called the Christ the Redeemer. So anyway, that's kind of a general gist of how this has impacted my day-to-day -day life which is quite a bit actually yeah all right perfect and um you know not to get into apologetics but uh you mentioned uh the catholic church catholic youtube um but you ended up choosing um anglicanism uh so do you can you like walk me through your reasoning a little bit yeah so it's not really i'm not i don't really have like a specific big like this is my thing this is the the thing when you're approaching something like the catholic church or you know, Anglicanism or Eastern Orthodoxy. It's like these churches, it's 2000 years old, right? I, there's nothing I'm going to say that's, you know, I can throw a critique out. It doesn't matter, like what I think, you know what I mean? 
Um, but the thing is, so as far as I'm concerned, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and the Anglican Church are all the Catholic Church, if that makes sense. Because all of them maintain apostolic succession, all of them maintain um, liturgy that has continuity back to the um, apostolic history. Both of them have been churches since the beginning of Christianity. Um, and so are all three branches, you know. So Anglicans generally subscribe to what's called branch theory, which is basically the church is found uh, wherever people are baptized. But in terms of the hierarchy of the church, the church is found wherever apostolic succession has been maintained. So in terms of the way that most, so I, I work in an office where there's a Reformed Baptist, a Presbyterian, uh, and a Roman Catholic, and <laughs> we all work together. Okay. And generally the, Ro the Roman Catholic and I are agreeing in terms of ecclesiastical discussion. Like whenever we're talking about uh, church structure and church hierarchy and things like that, um, apostolic succession, things like that, we're, we're usually on the same page. So uh, I would say in terms of why I chose Anglicanism, uh, I just have a, maybe this is because I grew up Baptist, I have a deep sense of, um, maybe this is partially because a lot of the Baptists broke away from the Anglicans, I have a deep sense of, um, sense of home in Anglicanism. I grew up reading C.S. Lewis, I grew up reading, um, you know, the Lord's Prayer with the thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen version, <laughs> you know, like, like the, the just the elements of I would say English speaking spirituality are are very much formed by Anglicanism. Um, if you go to a wedding, I was at a wedding recently, and the wedding began with "Dearly beloved, we are gathered together here in the sight of God and among these witnesses." You know, blah blah blah, whatever. And that even that liturgical element is from the prayer book, right? Um, and so Jordan Peterson talked one time recently about how like the King James Bible is sort of the fountainhead of or the Bible in general is the fountainhead for Western culture. And I'd say specifically for English speaking culture, it's the King James Bible, the Book of Common Prayer and Shakespeare that form the way we think. And so for me, it's, it's I, the best way I can say it is just it, it seemed like coming home. I, I felt like if I would have joined like Roman Catholicism or something, I would I think would have had a deep sense of imposter syndrome. <laughs> I, I don't belong here kind of thing. Okay. But Anglicanism just felt like this is where I belong, you know. Well, cool. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I think in my own journey, I feel like the what you mentioned at the beginning of these traditions are so old, like kind of feel weird critiquing them. Um, so yeah. I feel like that was a little bit uh, such a what I had as a feeling when I was just looking at them and I think I just ended up going with, you know, whatever feels sort of more comfortable, uh, still trying to look at the arguments, but at the end of the day, I'm not sure it's going to be an intellectual decision that's going to lead me to uh, either one of the churches. Yeah, what, what I began to think about, like, one of the things that drove me into the Anglican Church but this same argument can be applied to Roman Catholicism too, but it was, I need to stop just looking at, you know, the doctrinal statements, right? I grew up in a very confessional context. So we had, we looked a lot of the Westminster Confession and that, that sort of thing. I need to stop just looking at the theological declarations, right? That's like the seed form. It absolutely is important. It's not, that's not important at all, but that's the seed form of, the, of that denomination or communion, whatever you want to call it. And it's like the, the culture that comes up out of that is the tree, right? So you have to look at both to see what kind of, if worship is always first, right? So the way the historic church phrased this was like lex orandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi. The law of prayer or worship is the law of faith or belief. And then the law of faith and belief is the law of life, right? So if worship is always first, worship is always formative, then it is important to worship to look at the theological statements, but it's essential to look at the way the worship shapes the culture, right? So whenever I look back at um, Christian history, um, I still I still think in some ways like a Protestant, right? Because Anglicanism kind of has this joint identity, both as it participates in the Protestant Reformation, but it maintains its Catholicity as a church, which is interesting. It kind of falls into a strange category. <laughs> But one of the things about that drew me to Anglicanism specifically is like the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church, though if you want to understand what Anglicanism is, you just look at the prayer book, 
the the liturgy and everything that that defines what the church is because it's, it defines the way we worship right and so and then what what happened when that whenever the after the reformation happened is you have this explosion of culture like this this huge explosion you have like milton you've got shakespeare you've got george herbert and john dunn the metaphysical poets and that that line is faithful all the way down to like c.s lewis right you have this just this line of faithful christian creativity all the way up until c.s lewis uh, and that was part of what drew me to it as well as there's a creative element of a word made flesh element to what our churches churches should be defined by which is more that goes beyond just a doctrinal statement but it goes into the beauty of what that what that theology through that's acted out through the worship creates in terms of culture and that's kind of what that's i guess more specifically what drew me into anglicanism specifically yeah that's that's super interesting i can definitely um i recognize some of the authors you mentioned so i want to switch gears a little bit talking about uh your books uh you sure. look like an avid reader I'm a fan of literature. Oh, these are not mine. These are actually my uh, co-worker named Joe. Those are his books. <laughs> oh, okay. But I, my books are at home. So, but yeah, oh, they're okay, all okay, okay. So, um, of, well, yeah, yeah. Um, what are your three favorite books? Three favorite books. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would say number one would be The End of the Affair by Graham Greene. Uh, that book is... It changed the way that I viewed writing. It changed because before that point, I'd always kind of approached writing in terms of, there's a quote from C.S. Lewis where he said, we don't need more Christian books. We need more books written by Christians, right? And what I took that to mean was your Christianity needs to be hidden, right? I, the way that I actually personally interpreted that was your Christianity needs to be hidden. It needs to be a hidden element of your of your writing um so you're writing a story that doesn't deal with these themes like faith and things like that but it's more of like the worldview itself is christian in the sense that you have the correct moral worldview and things like that graham green rocked that out of me completely <laughs> he, his books are are a, they viscerally deal with faith in extremely strong ways and ways that non-christians and christians alike can appreciate so anyway the envy affair uh, the second one, or maybe that's tied for number one, would be Till We Have Faces from C.S. Lewis. Uh, I remember reading that book, and it just, I remember everything before I read that book, and then everything after I read that book. <laughs> it, it's like a, okay. it's a pivotal period for me, you know. It's one of those books I'm afraid to ever go back and reread because of how strong the experience was the first time. Um, however, it's weird. After, after I've become Anglican, I have yet to go back and read C.S. Lewis as an Anglican. And I, I am like preparing for that because I think when I go back and read him and Chesterton too, it'll feel like coming home. It'll feel like this really special experience of like you, like they were kind of the reasons why I feel at home there now. I just haven't okay. gone back to reread them, you know. Okay. Uh, Chesterton eventually became Roman Catholic, but most of his early stuff was Anglican. So, okay, besides those two, I would say I'll throw a nonfiction in here. Uh, I'll say... I'll do Chesterton. Orthodoxy from Chesterton. Um, that book was really formative for me as well in terms of every everything that he writes to me feels like when you're listening to a piece of music and it's perfect, you know, and you're like, there's nothing, there's nothing I could possibly change or wish was different about this song. It's perfect, okay. you know. Um, every single thing he writes feels like that to me. So, um, Anytime I've like had a long day, I'll just go read an essay from Chesterton and I'll feel better, you know. <laughs> um, it's like smoking for me to some people, you know. Okay. So cool. anyway, that's probably what I'd say. All right, all right, interesting. Um, so you, you describe sort of like this relationship between um, the literature uh, that stems from, you know, the Christian culture as being very formative for you and actually being what drew you back into a deeper appreciation of the, the Christian faith. Uh, and I think that's something I can definitely attest to. I'm going through the the Divine Comedy right now, um, mm, cool. and yeah. that it's 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 really good. <laughs> it's, it's I know it's an understatement, but like it's it's really good. Um, seeing There's Dante. No way to even it, talk about something like that. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. it's it's really really good. Um, seeing him go through hell, um, just 
I'm going, it's my first reading of it, so I'm just trying to take it in like it was, just not trying to think too deeply about it, uh, but I'm, I don't know, the way he is so Christian, uh, the worldview is so Christian, the way he weaves in theology sometimes with um, also the ancient authors, uh, it's just, it's constant references to ancient Greece and to the classical writers. Uh, it's it's almost like a reading list as he's you know as he's going through uh, through hell. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's those those kinds of things I just think are super important and um, it really make me appreciate Christian uh, tradition a, a lot more. And I think Jonathan's yeah, it, work can sort of like fit fit into that. Yeah, something if I could have if I could have Jonathan Paget do two things, what I would want is I would want him to do an interview discussion with Malcolm Geit who is a poet and they have some of the same ideas and uh, I would want him to do a series through some of C.S. Lewis's books. I think particularly I would want him to do one about the, about the great divorce. He's talked about it a little bit, but like in terms of what you're talking about with the divine comedy, it absolutely does the same thing of just how charged it is with the Christian worldview. It, um, I had a young guy, freshman in high school come to me and asked me like what book he should read. And I just told him that one and I gave it, I handed it to him. Like he asked for it and I brought it to him. Uh, and he read it that night. He finished the whole thing like that night, you know, it's, it's just, it's one of those books that it's like, a lot of people think it's about marriage or something because of the name, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and it's just charged with like, it'll just rack your brain and just change the way you think about so many things. And a lot of his stuff is like that, but I think it's because C.S. Lewis was so informed by people like Dante and Milton, you know, that it shapes the, everything that he wrote. You know, it's, it's somewhere like he, he grew up as an atheist and it's almost like he knew whenever he became a Christian, he couldn't just adopt like the idea, okay, there's God and there's the Trinity and there we go, now I'm a Christian. He knew he had to embrace the whole Christian worldview, which meant medieval philosophy, it meant medieval literature, all that kind of stuff, and, and integrate that into his own worldview, even as a modern person. And I'm um, you know, speaking about all these, all these artists, um, do you do anything you know, artistic, uh, creative, yeah, so my wife is an artist. I am terrible about, in terms of like any kind of painting or whatever. She's a, primarily a sculptor, uh, but she also, she teaches a class, a high school class for uh, like, a, like pen and ink style drawing, you know. Um, so she's actually beginning to get into iconography too, which is pretty fun. Um, and so anyway, yeah, so I have a great appreciation for art in terms of visual art. I have a human, I did my first, my associate's degree was in humanities. Um, and so it was all art history type stuff. So I have a huge appreciation for it. I'm just terrible at it. My creativity primarily goes into like writing and a little bit of music, but primarily in writing. So. Okay. And what kind of, uh, kind of stuff do you write? Um, I write badly. I'm <laughs> just kidding. I, uh, I, I got my MFA, my master's of fine art and creative writing. Um, I, if any of you know, the viewers are familiar with like Douglas Wilson, that whole, that whole crew up in Moscow, Idaho. Um, I went to New St. Andrews College and I received my MFA from there. So that really got me into how to write well. Um, so my, my final project was about basically a group of guys that um, decided to start a fake religion together. So that was, it was actually experimenting with a lot of Jonathan Padgett's concepts about the way that you know, truth, and you can't act out a lie like that for very long before it ends up unraveling, you know, because these religion, these aspects of religion are objective, and they really do have meaning. So you can't, you turn them around and use them for your own advantage, you know. Um, anyway, so there was that. And then right now I'm working on a project, uh, basically a, like a magic tree house style children's literature right now. So that's pretty much what I'm working on right now, trying to get that uh, published. So we'll see what happens. All right. Um, I have a question about what do you think are the differences between um, you know when you're writing for children and when you're writing for adults? Do you have you noticed anything differently? Yeah. So um, I can talk about this pretty easily from the perspective of movies. I think uh, like if you've watched like Disney movies or anything, there's kind of like two ways that there's two ways that filmmakers or when they're making films for movies will try to 
make it more fun, especially if there's adults watching, if they suspect that the parents might be watching with the kids. There's two ways. One is to make the meaning so deep that it's been like Pinocchio that even the parent is sitting there thinking, man, this is really deep, <laughs> right? Where the children are watching it and they're getting a certain le level and layer out of it. And then the parents are going even deeper, right? Um, like Lewis's children's literature is like this, right? You read Narnia and you read it as a child and you understand it and then you read it as an adult and you really understand it, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other way is like the carnal way to do it, which is um, just put a bunch of adult jokes that only the adults get. Right. So it's almost like with so like the children's literature that I'm writing is supposed to be the kind of literature that that parents will read to their kids and everybody has a pretty good time. Right. So it's not something that's like Dr. Like uh, Dr. Seuss doesn't talk down. Dr. Seuss is very wise, but it's not like a children's book that talks down. Right. It's supposed to be something that is actually going to convey some kind of meaning, some kind of nugget for the, even the adult that's reading it. Right. Um, and so I would say the difference is primarily, I think with children's literature, you have more license to be, to put the symbolism and meaning on the top, like to make it really clear what the symbolism and meaning is. Um, whereas I think uh, for like adult literature, you kind of want to be like breadcrumbed the information, like the meaning and stuff. Now that doesn't mean you just hand it to the children, right? But like in Narnia or something, whenever Aslan dies and rises again, the point is you're supposed to figure it out, right? <laughs> you're supposed to figure out what the meaning is, right? It's not supposed to be hidden away from you. So I think you're allowed to be a little bit more um, clear with what the symbolism and meaning are um, whenever you're writing for kids, but you don't want to make it so clear that you're talking down and just becomes propaganda, right? So that, that maybe becomes the more difficult part is how, figuring out how to balance that where it's not just you just writing an allegory but you're actually conveying a story while simultaneously not letting the story be so, um, so the meaning of the story being so hidden away that nobody gets anything out of it, except for maybe the parents. But I think that would probably be what I would, what I would say to them. Yeah, um, the, the reason I asked the question was because I was, I'm also reading through the, the fables of uh, La Fontaine mm. um, and, you know, being raised in the French speaking world, uh, there's no way as a kid that you don't encounter the fables, or at least, you know, some of them. Um, so I remember a bunch of the fables from just when I was a kid. But now picking the book back up uh, as an adult, and just uh, reading through them, um, what you're describing is exactly what La Fontaine is doing. You know, there's these really short stories, uh, the characters are oftentimes animals, um, and there's a very obvious lesson to the story. But then as you think about it, there's a whole sort of moral debate that takes place within the fable. Um, you can start, you know, questioning the fable a little bit. You can, um, there's like a primary conclusion and then there's sometimes like a second lesson that can appear uh, if you really think about the fable. Um, and yeah, so that's why I was asking you the question, you know, what are the differences that you, uh, that you experience when writing for adults versus children? Absolutely. I think that's probably my favorite part about reading to my daughter, like being able to read is that you like before you have kids, you keep thinking, I want to go back and read these stories that I read when I was a kid, or I want to go back and read these books. And then when you have a kid, you actually have to do it, you know? So first thing I read to my daughter was Wind in the Willows, which was amazing. And then we read Dog of Flanders and Dog of Flanders absolutely does that where you have this sort of dual meaning that's going on. And by the end, I was just sitting there, my wife was reading the end of it. I'm just bawling, you know, <laughs> you know, my daughter is like three months old, you know? <laughs> so anyway, yeah. All right. That's cool. Um, perfect. Okay. On writing. So you are a, uh, MFA creative writing. Um, mm -hmm. as an aspiring writer myself, uh, can you give me some advice for how to write something that's, interesting and yeah compelling okay um yeah so besides just the normal like be be ready to do it badly type stuff that people say i think yes. i can speak for myself i'm already like, very bad um, <laughs> yeah well then you're then you're started <laughs> that's good <laughs> um i would say um this was super helpful for me it might not be helpful for somebody else but 
being willing to put down the, ooh, I'm, I'm going to be a writer type thing and being willing to do something really simple and something that you feel like is condescending. Hmm. Um, so I was trying to write some kind of psychological fiction thing when I first started and it was terrible. <laughs> it was just, it was a nightmare. <laughs> and, um, and so my advisor, uh, Nate Wilson told me like, listen, man, this isn't you. This isn't the kind of thing that you should write. This isn't your personality, you know? And so I had all these visions about what I was going to do, you know? And he was like, I said, so I said, what's, what should I write? And he said, you're just, you're fit for quirky realism is what he said. Just, just whether that's, whether it's quirky humor for children or for adults, it, it, you're, you're made for this sort of ornery, playful sense of humor. That's odd, you know? Mm. So I went back to the drawing board and I went for, I went for it, right? So I wrote this version of the story where you have the three friends and they get together and create this false religion and it gets out of hand and stuff. Wrote a hundred pages. And I was just, I was kind of, I was kind of using a structure, but I was just kind of going for it. And I wrote the first hundred pages and then I went to an advisor meeting with them and they just shredded me. <laughs> like this is horrible, right? So I ended up taking a hundred pages and just throwing it in the trash, you know? Um, but one of the advice, piece of advice that the other advisor gave me was you need to use the structure of another story that already exists and is successful. And this sounds like when you first hear it, like that sounds like plagiarism. Every story does this, right? If, if there's only really one story and if there's only maybe four or five main versions of that story, and then all of them are kind of teasing out, out in different ways and putting them in different settings for different characters. And then it's not that you're doing that anyway, right? You're doing that whether you're aware of it or not. So it's better to be aware of it so that way you can kind of follow someone else's steps and then create a structure. Use that as your structure that, to then have your own creativity and have fun within that structure. So um, I ended up taking that same concept of the three friends to start the fake religion. And I uh, based based my story off of office space and so office space became kind of my the bone structure for the story and then i was i had a very clear sense of how long different sections needed to take and i knew how long i needed to spend different parts of the story and then by the end i think i wrote a pretty good pretty good story it ended up being you know 200 pages whatever so i think the the main thing is be willing to put down like the ego side of it and be willing just to study someone else's work it's sort of like when you're when you're doing art like the first time you do art you do a character study or you'll do a study of another person's piece or like you'll look at the mona lisa or something and you'll do a copy of it like it's, it, that's basically the exercise but for writing like do copy someone else's story just change the setting change the characters change the the situation and the goal and then you can have your own story but layered underneath underneath that is the original structure which is that original story and I think once you can do that really well, then you can ha sort of start having more freedom to write your own thing and do your own thing a little bit. But it kind of, at least to learn pacing and things like that, it's important to start with that structure that you know is solid and that has worked before. Hmm. And how does that advice apply to sort of um, to poetry, right? Like I'm trying to write poems mm -hmm. right now, uh, but I'm kind of stuck in between two worlds. In, on one end, I'm like, okay, I'm going to just write Shakespearean sonnets. And on the other end, there's like, but that's, that's annoying. I just want to, like, I just want to write stuff. Um, yeah. So I, I, I'm just going to write like free verse, just anything goes, just like, you know, ideas. Um, and so there's kind of like this extreme idea of order, this extreme idea of um, chaos on the other end. And it's just like, what do you do? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I think poetry is a good example of that, where poetry shoves you into this form, into this structure, right? So if someone writes a sonnet, you don't think, man, they're copying Shakespeare, <laughs> right? Like this form has been there forever, right? Now, but I think the key is taking the form and then, then improving it just enough to where you make it your own, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, Malcolm Guy, almost all of his poems are written as in sonnet form, but that doesn't mean they perfectly follow like iambic pentameter every time. It doesn't mean they perfectly rhyme in the exact sequential order, but they typically have 10 syllable or 10 syllables per line and 14 lines, right? So it's still typically, and usually the last two lines still have that same structure. 
So they still kind of follow the same general structure. I think there is absolutely a place for free verse poetry, but I think in order to do free verse well, it's kind of like with the story writing thing. You've got to start with the, do it within the lines, a like color within the lines first. And then that, so a good example of this is uh, Billy Collins' poem, Introduction to Poetry. And Billy Collins almost completely writes in free verse. Like he, he just writes, you know, in free verse. And his poems are beautiful. They don't typically rhyme in any way. But I was I was using that, this poem to teach my class a couple of days ago or a week ago. And the only line of the poem that's in rhythm, that's in has typical meter, I think it's iambic tre- tetrameter, I think is what it is, is um, the base of the poem is, has all these different sections where it's giving all these metaphors for how we're supposed to read poetry. Um, and but the only one that has standard meter is the line press your ear against its hive when talking about the poem it says to press your ear against the poem's hive so and and press it press an ear against its hive is the only part of the poem that has this really strong metrical element to it so he's he's taking typical poetic standards and forms and then using it in a strategic moment because it's the one part of the poem that's talking about sound right so so it's important to do it within the form and then figure out how to use those same principles and ideas of how, say, different meters affect you, how different meters affect your, your reader, and then then applying those same concepts into a free verse poem. So even if it's still a free verse poem, you're still using metrical ideas um, within the poem itself. So it, either way, you're, you, even if you're doing free verse, you still need to be mindful of the way that you're integrating um, poetic rhythm and things like that into um, into that, even if it is free verse. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. Um, using the order, like the sudden order, to draw attention to something or to uh, to give it a special effect. Exactly. Music does the same thing, but sometimes in reverse, right? Um, and you can do this in reverse too. If you have a poem that's in sonnet form, um, and then you have one line that doesn't rhyme, it brings a ton mm-hmm. of attention to that line, right? So. The same thing in music. This is like if, if you're if you're you know playing with a band and you do a sudden dissonant chord, it brings a lot of attention. It has a really strong effect to it. So, being able to break by using chaos and order as like balancing chaos and order, and then shifting suddenly to one or the other, you can if you're you know if you're resting in order, shifting to chaos, or if you're resting in chaos, shifting to order, um, you can create a lot of drama and attention. Uh, strength in a certain poem or song that you're writing by using that as a technique. And um, what about sort of like uh, symbolism in stories? I think I've, uh, I don't know if I remember correctly, but I've uh, heard Jonathan say at some point, you know, when you're writing something, don't worry about putting the symbolism in there. Um, And I request for Jonathan, I wish he'd do sort of like a video or something, breaking down how he goes about his writing process. Um, but for you, what's what's been your experience in trying to make a story symbolically meaningful without forcing it in the story in a way? Yeah, I think if you try to force it, it's really, really obvious, right? So, like, say if you start symbol first and you say, I really want to write a story about, you know, with dying and rising, whatever, or, you know, I want to really want to focus on this symbol. What the story turns into is just a propaganda, <laughs> right? It becomes the whole story is just there to serve. Now there's an element, there's a value in allegory, right? Like I'm a huge fan of Pilgrim's Progress, but if you're just in terms of writing a genuine story, um, it's not just for like devotional moral principles, like teaching moral principles. If you start with symbol for the story is going to be all over the place and it's going to be really obvious what you're trying to do. But the, the, the reason for that is we don't think about symbols in a vacuum, right? We don't think about, people really get interested in this kind of thing where they start talking about like this symbol means this and this, but the way we experience symbols isn't within a a vacuum where you just see these individual symbols. You receive symbolic thinking through narrative. Like that's the way that it always happens, right? Virgin birth, incarnation, dying and rising Christ, ascension. We, we, this is why the liturgical calendar is so important. It's because it's, it's a constant reminder that these stories don't exist in a vacuum, but they, they, they are developed organically through this whole symphonic progression, you know? And so because we think symbolically by, by the nature of just being human beings, as long as you're steeped in scriptural symbols, you will write in a, in a 
mode of Christian symbolism, you're going to write symbolically no matter what, right? Mm-hmm. If you if you sit down to write anything and you're a human being, you will write symbolically, whether you're trying to or not. But if you, that's why it's so important to make sure you're steeped in Christian tradition, church fathers, scripture, because that frames the way that you think. Um, and then whenever you sit down to write, you'll these symbols will emerge to you while you're writing a scene. So um, an example is I didn't use this in my story, but this was one that I had written a scene I had written and then discarded. There was a scene where this couple was having an argument before um, the, wi- the wife's parents were on her way to the house. And this couple was having an argument, but they were preparing the wife was preparing bread and the, the husband was like getting the wine bottles ready. And I, I wrote that and I began to think like, oh, like it's communion. Right. Mm. Like, but it's breaking communion. Like they're having this argument and there's this tension. Right. But you have this sort of anti symbol of bread and wine here as a symbol of fellowship. But the, the it's there to bring attention to the fact that this fellowship is being risked. Right. So if you if you just write organically, you'll discover the symbols as you write them. Uh, however, there are some times that you look back and you think this symbol might be more appropriate and then you can go back and adjust it after the story is already existent. But the key is to not think symbol first. It's to write the story because that's where sim- that's where symbols take find their embodiment is within narrative itself, not within just looking at the symbols in a vacuum like you're looking at them in a science museum or something, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it, it does. Um have to think about all that stuff in my my own writing, um, you know, mm. order, chaos. What kind of stuff are you interested in writing? Um, so there's a couple of things. Uh, daily practice, I guess, is just poetry about life. Um, you know, I was at work the other day, and I just had an idea, wanted to write about that. So that's kind of just to keep the habit going. Um, and the goal writing is, uh, well, I'm going to start studying medicine soon. So my end goal would be to communicate medical knowledge, especially about like psychiatry and uh, the mind consciousness through like uh, artistic form. Um, I I do enjoy reading scientific papers and the way they're laid out, uh, but I think there is definitely value in having a more artistic representation of science. And I think that the power in communicating that information in a way that's more uh, artistic is there. And I, that's sort of like the end goal of what I aim to do. So I'm just prepping while uh, I'm going to get the medical knowledge through school. I also want to build up that creative ability, uh, that ability to write well. Um, and hopefully in yeah. 10 years, when I'm done studying, I'll have something uh, useful to write. That's awesome. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. I, I have been reading a novel called La Russe right now by uh, Eugene Vodoloskin. And uh, the beginning of that novel might be of interest to you uh, as you're getting into trying to figure out how to do that um, because a lot of the um the approach to say plants like different kinds of plants and how they can be turned into the like antidotes for different diseases and things like that just the vision of how say a medieval christian would view that symbolically is really beautiful in that book so that might be something you might be interested in all right perfect i'll check it out um on that note, I think we've been going for about 45 minutes, so uh, we can wrap it up. Uh, is there anything you have out there online that people you, know, you, you may want people to check out? Yeah, right now I know I'm trying to get some things published and stuff, but in terms of right now, I just you know probably just follow me on Twitter, you know, just so people people can be aware of anything that I'm putting out in the future. Um, you can find me on Instagram or Facebook too. So anyway, yeah, just the usual spot. All right, perfect. Well, and on that, it was a pleasure talking to you. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Bye-bye.